Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. It's about all of life through the prism of food. And this week I'm with journalist and author Claire Finney, whose new book, Hungry Heart, is a memoir which unravels her tricky relationship with food. Whether I was speaking to Diana Henry or whether I was speaking to, you know, my friend Emma from school, we really learned as we were talking and every conversation I had was quite powerful in that regard. I think both people felt, gosh, I'd never stopped to think about the role of divorce and food, which is still which is a subject I want to continue to explore because I find it really fascinating and, and kind of unexcavated. I asked her, as a food journalist whose job it is to consider who we are as a food nation, where that complexity sits with other food cultures, which perhaps are more connected to why and what they eat. Gosh, I mean, that's a really interesting one. And obviously, I, I suppose I don't feel well-versed enough in other food cultures and able to speak on their behalf at all. But I suppose there's partly we're a multi, very multicultural nation. We've had a lot of outs- external influences. That leads to a lot of the joy of our food scene. But it also makes our food scene just more complicated. In a really good way, it makes it more complicated. But it does mean that we don't have the same kind of staples, regularity. We've... We're more secular, so that we don't have kind of just a religious uh, ritualism to the way that we eat. We don't eat, um, you know, the same thing on a Friday, the same thing on a Saturday. I mean, there are still many cultures within this country that do. And I, having spoken to people like um, my friend's mum, Angela, and who's, who's Jewish, my friend Jay Foreman, who grew up in a Jewish family as well, um, yeah, various people from, you know, from Hinduism, from Judaism. I did envy that. I envied that part of their, that, not that it's simple at all. And as um, Gerd Loyal points out when in my interview with him, you know, the uh, abundance of feasting that there was um, in his um, household growing up uh, as a kind of British Punjabi, also led to his own kind of slightly no longer but slightly tortured relationship um for a while with um with indian food so with eating rather than indian food wasn't it it was about too much and the expectation of being all around i mean that's really interesting isn't it yeah i do think that we have a lot of a media narrative around food that makes it very um inextricable with identity and politics and it's interwoven with so much of our life that that isn't straightforwardly celebratory or straightforwardly about nourishment or straightforwardly about companionship often it's so much beyond that you know often people are are militant in their dietary requirements and sometimes to the exclusion of the sociability of of meal times. I think that's the essence of it, isn't it? It's the purpose of food in our culture. You know, I'm just thinking about all the many of the European cultures, certainly most of the Middle Eastern cultures, you know, just basically everywhere in the world. It Mm. is about Mm. companionship, you know, and that's where the breaking bread comes from, compane in in Italian and Latin. Um, You know, and and it is the functionality Mm. of food that you talk about. It's a story of, well, it's your story. It's It's a memoir of somebody who's still very young and I want to talk about the role of memoir in a person who's barely started living (laughs) Um, (laughs) but who has so much to say about growing up with food and it's you know, a typical family in so many ways. Uh, it's a it's a family that suffered from rupture or experienced rupture and and healed a lot of the, the recipes are not about amazing food and that's the point yeah, isn't yeah. it i mean tell me what you what you were trying to do what did you want to achieve with the book? i i mean it evolved as as i was writing and writing it was a very therapeutic experience and at the time even when i'd finished the book i was very much of the view that it wasn't a memoir at all and i kept insisting that it wasn't a memoir and um you know, the publishers said, we're describing it, continue to describe it as a memoir. And I was like, I don't think it is a memoir. I don't think, it's, I think, I think the categorization is wrong and was complaining to my boyfriend about it. And then he was one of the first person who read it and he finished it and he was like, it's brilliant. It is a memoir. Yeah. <laughs> it's a memoir. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> but it has other people's stories interwoven in. So that's my, that's what I want to get across. Is it's not just about me, but... 
But as all memoirs do, because it is about how you bump into people and how you explore who you are. I mean, let's talk about that kind of complex relationship that you have with food um, very early on. So it is about, you know, really unraveling who you are with food. So you're constantly, as anybody would be, talking to your friends, saying, well, you know, what about that? Uh, did you do that? You can tell me about your bit of that. So it, it is very much a memoir, trying to understand mm. who you are. That's how I read it. Is that what you were really trying to do, an unravelling? I think it was a bit of an unravelling. I think the conversations that I had with so many different people, some of whom are very well known, some of just some of whom are just known to me, really. But all those conversations illuminated my own relationship with food further, as well as illuminating, you know, their lives and their experiences. And it, and it felt like a very mutual conversation, whether I was speaking to Diana Henry or whether I was speaking to, you know, my friend Emma from school. You know, we we really learned as we were talking. And it was, yeah, every conversation I had was quite powerful in that regard. I think we, from both sides, both people felt gosh, I'd never stopped to think about the role of divorce and food, which is still which is a subject I want to continue to explore because I find it really fascinating and, and kind of unexcavated, really. Um, and because all of those conversations were so helpful, by the, end, by the time I reached the end of the book, what I wanted to achieve was to allow other people to be part of that conversation, which is why there were prompts at the very end um, to encourage people to keep talking and... The best feedback I've had is from someone who took it, a copy on, away on holiday with them with a big group of friends. And she said, almost every night we ended up talking about your book, not because we were talking about your book per se, but because we'd been struck by something that reminded us something of a feature of food in our own lives and how we relate to others through it. Oh, totally. I mean, that's exactly what I did. I spent the evening um, having dinner out with my husband um, and he had a very, very different relationship with food. His mother never joined them at the table, for example, Jewish family. Um, she stayed in the kitchen, as a lot of women did. Yeah, and I've read yeah. about that since in Claudia Roden's book of Jewish food. It's very normal. Um, it's also a class thing. Um, and as I tried to sort of talk to him about, you know, what was happening around that table, it pierced mm. memories that really, and we've been married 28 years, he has never been able to remember. Wow. wow. Really extraordinary. That's, gosh, it's amazing. so powerful. And wow. I immediately texted my daughters and said, please just dream write your food memories for me. I really want to understand, you know, kind of our relationship as a family with food. Um, so we're going to do a whole load of work on that. So yeah, I know exactly right. what you mean by that. Oh, that's so nice. What a great gift for you to be able to kind of unravel your own really complicated relationship with food. And then at the end to be able to say, and what about you? to the world yeah. that's a it's a really yeah. wonderful thing let's go into that complex relationship it's a it is about associations with food it's about mental health mm. and it's about mental illness and you it is about your mental illness with food is it simplistic to say that that started with your parents relationship unraveling and turning into a divorce uh yes i think mm, so course. yes um it's been the sort of easy go-to answer for uh you know, various therapists that I've seen over the years. And um, it was a relief to find one who didn't kind of reach for that yeah. obvious conclusion. I think it's it's very multifaceted. I think the divorce, I think both have indelibly shaped me. And it was a very happy divorce, as, as divorces go. <laughs> I always say they divorced happily ever after. Um, so it was a rupture only in so far as how I experienced it, not in so far as my parents delivered it. Yeah it made me a slightly less confident, less sort of secure child and therefore, yeah, probably more prone. Um, I have had quite a lot of therapy and wouldn't have been able to write the book without it, I don't think. There are, you know, there are many, there are many things that feed into that situation, not least the culture in which we live. You know, there's, I, I can't even imagine being a teenage girl or boy now you know, with social media, this was even before social media, it was yeah. predates that. Yeah. Um, and interesting, fascinating, really, that you turn to food writing. I mean, very early yeah, on. Yeah. I mean, how old were you when you first started writing about food? I was 22. Yeah. Um, it was what I started work experiencing at the publishing company that did Borough Markets magazine 
when I was still studying for my journalism master's at Goldsmiths and that was my first job and I continued to write for Borough Market. Yeah and how was that to you know because you were still suffering from yeah, a yeah, eating very disorder much so very much yeah. so and it had been very serious how was that to be writing about food was it a way of controlling it in a way but it also just broadened my horizons as to what food was so drastically I wouldn't say it was a Damascene moment because it was a slow build up over the years you know it, it wasn't like Borough Market cured me but you speak to producers you speak to people who travel the world for great ingredients and are so passionate about produce. You see the community of the market. I think that was really significant. Um, seeing the way that the market brought people together, continues to bring people together, continues to spark up conversations. It is entirely possible to be a food writer and not eat very much food. I've I have met people like that at press trips and yes, it's very yes. interesting to watch that relationship. Um, it's not a book about anorexia or bulimia. It is a book about associations and relationships with food in this very particular food culture at a particular time. You cite academics and psychologists and you, you do try to, to, to you know, pick at this, this complicated relationship. I love the idea of the good enough mother. Um, you say that she, and this obviously is about your mother. It's about the mother who caters entirely to her child at first and then increasingly compromises as her child becomes mm. less dependent and more able to cope with her failure, which is lovely. This is about a mother who's just doing what she can. She's good enough. I can't yeah. imagine Ravinda describing her mother that way or, or Gerd Loyal or, or Samaya Osmani <laughs> or Oslem or any of the people who we got on the show who are part of this you know wonderful food writing community of ours none of them would be able to say about the good enough mother they would always <laughs> be producing something absolutely fantastic every single time wouldn't they what is it yeah, about the yeah. British mother <laughs> well I think you know my mum had an absolutely fantastic career for one thing um I also just think food isn't at the heart of our culture in the same way. And again, we don't have that, we don't have that ritualism around it. There isn't, you know, for worse and for better, we don't attach so much emotional significance to food. Or rather, we overlook it, perhaps. And I think also it's about priorities. You know, my mum would rather, especially post-divorce, and this is why the divorce is so is not binary in terms of its positives and its negatives, it made my parents value time more than anything else in the whole world. Time with their children was and is the most important thing. And if that meant fish fingers, then it meant fish fingers. And also, love fish fingers. And it made us happy and it made them happy. Everyone's a winner. And the easy, the concept of the easy tea is, was one of my favourite things to explore because what it actually represents, and this isn't in me in any way a lauding ultra-processed food because easy teas aren't necessarily ultra processed food in fact they rarely are they're more just a kind of bung it all on a plate bung on a plate situation they're the moments that we may remember most fondly in fact we were talking only last night about cod in a bag do you remember the which came with a parsley white <laughs> yes, parsley sauce oh, God. oh mashed potatoes peas cod in a bag love it but actually your first food moment and the first f story in the book is very different and it is very rooted yes. and it is your grandma's millionaire shortbread your grandma was the person who really taught you the visceral nature of a food memory uh she she yeah. literally put your hands in flour for the first time and, and literally <laughs> yes. made you play with icing sugar tell us about that first food moment so this is, um, yeah, the very opening of the book. It's when I'm making millionaire shortbread with my grandmother, but my grandparents had a hotel um, by the seaside. And so in the midst of all the hustle and bustle and flurry of feeding guests and looking after grandchildren and cleaning rooms, etc., my grandma would miraculously carve out just a little slither of time to spend with us, you know, making something or... Or kind of my grand, we'd go down into the cellar and play with wood whilst my grandpa, my granddad made whatever he was fixing for the hotel. Um, and yeah, I just had this really vivid memory of standing on a stool, um, mixing the mixture for the shortbread. And it's 
remains even though my grandma's cakes are extraordinary she is very much of the generation whereby she'd rather the food be perfect than be present Mm. than herself be present um and it just this particular moment actually that i you know wanted to talk about was when was quite recently when we went down to visit her and it was the first time my boyfriend had met her and it would have been his grandma's birthday that weekend and he had this piece of millionaire shortbread that my grandma continues to make, especially if I'm going down. And he was like, oh, this is exactly how, this tastes exactly like my grandma used to make. And it was so poignant, like that connection between, you know, not just between him and my grandma and him and me and my grandma, but between the living and the dead, essentially, and between grandmas from very different backgrounds, you know, across the divides. It was extraordinary. And that is when, you know, that is when food is is so much more than the thing itself exactly it's a it's a it's a wonderful moment um and it's a lasting legacy as well mm. um and ultimately your love of food has won out um but we yes. do in your second food moment go into you know the the complicated relationship and your second food moment is about carbs and i have literally just had this conversation <laughs> with ravinda bogle um she talks about when she was in her early 20s um she was doing some modeling and she overheard the photographer talking about her being photographically fat. Wow. She was five foot six and seven stone. Oh, my God. And so she stopped eating carbs. And the, her relationship with bread was the thing mm. that suffered. You talk about something very similar mm. in your second food moment. Tell me about that. I think, again, this speaks quite a lot about our culture in that we don't have, we've lost sight really of our go-to staple, the one that we, that our society, our culture congregates around, you know, rice, pasta, bread. We don't really have that anymore. And as a result, we lose sight of what carbs invariably mean, which is, which is a staple and staple both in the sense of we eat it routinely, but because we eat it routinely, it binds us together. And therefore I love the word staple because it, it's a play. It's a good word play. Um, and it's easy to cut out carbs. There isn't such a pull around them um, when you're here. And I, like Ravinda, hadn't really, didn't really eat them for years. Um, would have a kind of token amount, but would maintain that I didn't like bread. I mean, that's how far I went. That's insane. Who doesn't like bread? And bread is particularly significant, I think, a particularly significant thing to avoid because there is a type of bread in every single culture across the world. And it's ancient and it's been a form of civil it's been a sign of civilization it's been a sign of community for such a long time for centuries and centuries and i my moment is the moment when i kind of came back to bread and is probably the biggest kind of uh quote unquote epiphany that i've ever had in my life was when i was in paris with my best friend lizzie and we hadn't really eaten all day because we'd just been walking and you know seeing things and we'd climb the tower and we'd come back and we had a glass of rosé and they bought us a basket of bread and i was a bit like oh we've got dinner in two hours i don't want to fill up blah 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 and lizzie just tucked in and eventually i couldn't resist and i just picked up the kind of fridge cold president butter smushed it on the baguette and I remember exclaiming to her, I bloody love bread. I just, yeah, I couldn't believe that I'd been denying myself such simple but profound joy for so many years. Um, And it's particularly in Paris where bread is, you know, is par for the course. It comes with everything. Um, And it's particularly, you know, it's so symbolic to French culture that I think it's UNESCO protected, the baguette. Um... I felt really part of something. I really, really felt part of, you know. I was going to say, it's about, it's about joining a community, yes. the rest of the world. Yes. We're all is. loving, well, not everybody loves life. A lot of people are saying no to those kind of things. But mm. saying yes is about actually saying, oh, my God, there's a whole world out there. Yes, yeah. And, but, it, but it's hard, isn't it, for anyone who has had that association, who has an eating disorder to, you can't, it's not about as, something as simplistic as saying, oh, Sorry, I'll just do it anyway. No, 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 it's not. No, it's not. It's very hard to see, to look beyond actually carbs and calories and fat. And, you know, that's what, that's what these foods end up 
meaning to you. You you see bread and you don't see comfort. You don't see companionship. You don't see a tradition that transcends cultures and creeds and countries. You just see calories. And that is the bleakest existence. And there's a lovely moment in the book, which you haven't actually chosen. Uh, You do talk in your next third uh, food moment about um, the the power of friendship. But Mm. actually, there's a lovely moment where one of your friends or a group of friends are all getting together and you're being old Claire and going, well, I can't do this and I can't eat that. And, And they just go, Oh, for God's sake, you know, and it was about being part of that community that you Mm. chose, that somehow was you were able by that time, presumably through a lot of therapy to be able to go, do you know what? I just want to be with them. And it's again that saying yes and joining, you know, being part of something. Yes. Um, Let's go into the power of your friendships. Your third food moment is all about that. And you do talk to other writers, Polly Russell, Gerd Loyal, B. Wilson, Diana Henry in the book about how food shaped them but it is the school days and the family days as they change that's about your own story and this one the halloumi avocado (laughs) gin on the bathroom floor (laughs) tell us about this one so this is and i genuinely could not tell you how we came to be doing this i think maybe (laughs) one day one of us had been sobbing on the bathroom floor and another of us had brought in a gin and tonic as you do this is me and my housemate katie um (laughs) And it evolved into a tradition whereby every couple of months, when it felt like we were really overdue an epic catch up, we'd sit on the bathroom floor, we'd even take um, grilled halloumi and avocado <laughs> in there and gin, and we would just chew the cud and talk about yeah, like the kind of the big stuff that we neglected to talk about, you know, when we were just making tea for each other in the morning before work. Um, and one time in particular, I remember we decided to do the 32 love questions that make two strangers fall in love not because we wanted to fall in love but because we thought it would be funny and yeah it was really it was hilarious we also discovered a lot about each other having even even after being friends for you know six or five years and it really taught me a lot about the power of ritual the power of creating a sacred space in which you do talk about things that aren't the mundane, that aren't the everyday, and how food and drink can create those spaces as well. Um, my boyfriend's friends have a uh, thing called Under the Grillo, where they where they put each other under the Grillo, and the Grillo, grillo is a wine, uh, Sicilian wine, and they'll go to a Sicilian restaurant or the Grillo. And it's not, and it's not about getting smashed. It's more just like, okay, we've created this moment by virtue of having Grillo, by virtue of being in a being in a Sicilian restaurant, we've created a moment in which we're going to be open with each other. Um, and yeah, food and drink have a have a real power to do that in a way that I think very few things do. They do. And I was just taken back then um, to one of the last real life lunches I had before lockdown was with uh, Tara Wigley and Sammy Tamimi um, just before Palestine came out. And I remember... Sammy telling me a story then about the going back to Palestine, Palestine Mm -hmm. for him. Um, And as a gay man, it was very difficult for him to be able to go home. Um, And his mother would, of course, and his, you know, all the the family would bring out loads and loads and loads of food as they'd always done. And there was this ritual of lots lots of food and nobody was ever going to talk about him being a gay man. Um, But in the feeding and in the pure joy and the celebration of that ancient ritual that had happened for generations and, you know, hundreds of years within that culture, there was that wonderful Mm. unspoken depth that you didn't have to talk about it because the ritual existed. So what you're talking about is creating a ritual so that it opens up. A, a conversation but what I think Sammy was talking about and it was interesting that Tara talked about it in an observational way mm. because she noticed what was going on there oh, Sammy just so lovely. felt it it was a lovely lovely moment you created a, a, a moment for your fourth food moment with your mother that yeah. was very healing um, I love this this idea I wish I'd done it with my mother um, I think that so many women would hear this and read this in your book and go do you know what I'm going to do that that is such a great idea three yeah. scoops of gelato, scoops of gelato. I mean I could not recommend 
this more actually to any mother and daughter or father and son um, or father and daughter. Uh, we cycled the Velodicy, which is um, from Roscoff to Biritz. Uh, so it's the length of France. And we did it over the course of 14 days. And it was about between 50 and 70 miles a day. So this this was only last year. So, you know, both of us, my mother had also suffered from eating disorders when she was, um, you know, at a similar stage of her life as I suffered with mine. And whilst both of us were, you know, very much recovered by this point, it was such a kind of consolidation of all that we'd been through and all that we'd been through together. And the way we kind of settled into this by necessity at first and then through joy into a routine that that fueled us but fueled us so deliciously because we were in France you know where protein bars are a sin essentially um and it wasn't that food was fuel in a straightforward way but it kind of cemented the idea of just relaxing into um a routine with somebody and and taking joy in that and it was the first time we'd really spent such a long time together and all day talking like all day just riding side by side you know or well, taking it in turns to lead and yeah. that that's the that's the image that I love the sort of the separate but together because you know you do write that um what was really interesting and I just want to pull you up on that because mm. it you it was sort of a giveaway line but what was really important was that you had a fixation with eating and weighing exactly what your mum ate yes. and weighed at the same age and you say that it had created a second and wildly distorted umbilical cord mm. but by by riding s- separately but together side by side there's yeah. there's a wonderful understanding of that connection but you've separated. Yes, yes, yes. We, we, you know, we we went from a sort of that that just like slightly distorted relationship and quite destructive intimacy to an intimacy that was that was very genuinely mother and child and and friends as well, like adult women being friends. And Amazing. that's that's the relationship we have now. And we had it before we did the cycle ride. We've had it for many years, but the cycle ride really kind of brought that home to me. And there was one particular moment um, where we decided to have, we'd normally have two scoops of gelato, but it was on a 70 mile or 75 mile day. And in a way, that's also irrelevant. Like the number of miles we'd cycled was was sort of irrelevant. What mattered was we decided to say, fuck it, we're having three scoops each. We're having three (laughs) scoops each. And it was enormous and it was so good. And it was so hot and we were so dusty and sweaty. And we just ate these three scoops hoovered them up and I think it is the first time in probably two decades that either of us have had three scoops of gelato each and it was a great moment. It's there's a lovely sort of narrative and which I'm sure you didn't even know you were heading towards when you started no, the book no, as no. most writers don't. When you got to the end and we've talked about how you've left the end of the book open for other people to to fill in their own memories in, in a very it's, a, it's the art of giving, isn't it? Mm. For you, you know, you're still so young at 34. Does it feel like you've done this massive journey where you completed the first bit that you can now be a proper grown up? <laughs> <laughs> yes it does it does actually that's a very good I hadn't thought about it like that but I suppose yes it feels like the ending of quite a turbulent period in my life and in many ways in many ways just as your 20s are your teens and 20s childhood are turbulent times um and it does feel like I've closed the page on that chapter yeah, on that particular chapter in a in a really satisfying way. And um yeah, writing the last paragraph was was really quite emotional <laughs> to be honest. Um and because it because there was that sense a sense of a real ending that was beyond just the ending of the book or the ending of the word document in that instance. It was an ending that was that was bigger than that, but I was also delighted to close it and move on thanks for listening do pop over to Substack for extra bites of Claire reading from her book just search for Jilly Smith on Substack and do follow me on Instagram I'm at Smith. 
and I'll see you next week.